rest in his love I will trust the Lord Oh my soul All right, we're in the last third of the Sermon on the Mount. If you're just joining us, Jesus' visionary manifesto for life, his vision of what the abundant life looks like, where he reigns and rules as King of kings and Lord of lords over our lives, and it's the greatest possible freedom and power we could ever experience. And so that is an upside-down notion from the world because if you have a king in the world, then the assumption is, well, the king is oppressing me. The way the kingdom of our Father in heaven works, when we have a king in heaven, when we recognize and follow Jesus as Lord of our life, that actually ends up being the path to freedom and abundance. It's a really cool thing that God set up. <laughs> he gets the glory, you get the joy. He's king of kings, you get fully alive in the abundant life of knowing him. And so we're in this final third, and as always, Jesus has life-giving news, but you might have to die first in order to come alive in this new way of life. So let's check it out. Matthew 7, chapters, or excuse me, seven, chapter 7, verse 1 to 6. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your own eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. All right. This is a good one. This is a fun one. Jesus is the master of wise, healthy relationships. And he wants what's best for us. He knows what's best for us. And so in this situation, he's going to address, like he does many times, a normal, vicious cycle that humanity in our brokenness, on our own strength, gets ourselves all whipped up into problems. And then he's going to bring a kingdom solution. A question from the beginning to ponder that summarizes what Jesus is saying, I believe, is that in your sphere of influence, another way to think about it, to ponder and meditate on God's word, is are you cultivating a culture of judgment that criticizes people, or are you cultivating a culture of grace that, that calls out the gold in people, calls out the good. Every single one of us has this little sphere of influence. It starts with just you, extends to your immediate family and friends. So if you're married to your spouse, if you've got kids to kids, to close family to close friends, and then it spreads out into wherever you set your feet. It might be at work, it might be in the neighborhood. Depending on what spheres of influence God's given you, it could be much larger than that. So this passage really is about the atmosphere that we set wherever we go, the culture that we cultivate in our sphere of influence. And Jesus is going to talk about the brokenness in humanity that sets a culture of critical judgment now, what judgment means in this context is, back in the day, very similar to today. It has to do with kind of like the penal code and like a judge giving a final rendering, a conclusive verdict. But if a, just, if a judge is just, if we think about that, back then, now, if a judge is just, 
that conclusive rendering, that final verdict does not come quick, right? It's arrived at after a very long process of exploration, fact-finding, listening to various sides and perspectives, not coming with a, a preconceived prejudicial conclusion. It's a true searching for truth and a weighing of all things. And then lastly, the judge's job is a final judgment must be rendered. In contrast to that, what might be or could be, should be a healthy process of judgment for a judge, Jesus is getting at something that humanity does in our brokenness. He is pointing out that we are prone to unbelievably quick judgments of one another before we have the facts, before due process, so to speak, before we even know a person's intentions or motivations or challenges or what they were just going through that day that made them say that rude thing. It's very easy, though, is it not, to see an action, to see an attitude, and do what Jesus says to make a, a judgment. When we are quick to do that, what Jesus points out is that it creates a, an atmosphere, a culture of judgment, of judging one another that becomes a vicious cycle in which toxic criticism becomes the norm in how people treat each other. And that's what, that's what Jesus means when he says, in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. With the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. There's this back and forth that he's talking about. This is a vicious cycle. This is the culture, the atmosphere that Jesus is talking about in which toxic criticism can become the norm. And I, I even struggle with thinking about like, man, should, what, are, what are some modern day examples? <laughs> uh, how far should we go, you know? But if you think about our world today, mm, toxic criticism has, has almost become a badge of honor. And, and, and the church can very easily participate in this culture of toxic criticism without even a, a heartbeat thinking about it because of what is also connected, which is what we know we're, we're right on this issue. So the ends justify the means. It doesn't matter what culture we create in the, in, in the midst. Let me give you an example. I was driving out of the Canyon Lake yesterday after the men's group, waiting at the signal, and, and a golf cart pulls up next to me, and two flags. There's a nice big American flag. And I'm like, ah. Oh. And Independence Day is coming up. I love America. I'm proud to be an American. I think it's amazing. I think it's the best country on earth. I think it has the greatest foundational documents ever. Very, very, very connected to the biblical picture of citizenship and under God and all that fantastic stuff. So I'm like, yes, America. I'm gonna wear my America t shirt. This week, all week, got a few different, I almost wore it this morning, I forgot, actually, I have some little America, Captain, Captain America button down, I forgot it. Anyways, and then right next to it, F Biden, huge flag, and it's F, American flag, CK, Biden. Ugh. Hmm. And looked over at the driver, because now I'm judging. <laughs> I'm thinking about this message. It's like a 16-year-old kid. I mean, the dude can't be the day over 16. And I'm just thinking, though, and it's like, man, like, I, I just got assaulted. And I'll be honest, I'm not a fan of Biden or his policies, but I got assaulted. Like, F Biden, whoa. Like, because that message is not just F Biden. That's like F everyone who voted for him. So F half the country. And it's just, I'm just thinking about it. It's like, ah, 
I know, I know you don't like the policies. I get that. I, I don't either. But it's like, how many healthy, productive conversations have you had when you start it with F you? Now let's talk. And you know what? None of us would be surprised if there was also a little Christian bumper sticker on that golf cart. Some of us might be like, go for it, brother. And that's where we got to <laughs> gotta separate policy from the kind, uh, from relationship. Jesus is going after how, what part do we play in contributing to the relationships, the spheres of influence that we have? And are we doing whatever we can to model a culture of relationship that honors and reflects our heavenly father? Now, that does not mean in your relationships you can't disagree and stand up for truth. But what Jesus is going after is, be careful, we're so prone as humans to make judgments of one another and create a culture of toxic criticism that we've got to, and what does Jesus say? The first thing to do is check your own heart. And it's like, man, I'm challenged by that. I'm challenged because I was both assaulted by that. I was offended by that. I'm judging the kid. It's like, and I'm thinking like, wow, what, what does it do to the atmosphere in our culture? We're now, that, that's just normal. He's going to get laughs. He's going to get honks. He's going to get high fives. But this part of it, like, as a 16-year-old kid, like, what do you actually know? You've, you've had a childhood, and now you've got a lot of hormones. I have had two 16-year-olds, and I can say with all the strength and confidence from heaven, you don't know much. <laughs> but yet in his, you know, he's willing to judge half the country with a F you if you want to talk to me. It's like, ah. I think that's what Jesus is going after. That Jesus' followers can be different that even when we feel like we might notice imperfect people or their problems and we see flaws in people, Jesus is calling for our first response is judgment day about you as a person is not today. And I am not the judge. But rather, in contrast, I am an ambassador of reconciliation. In the same way, I have been shown undeserved grace because I deserve hell but didn't get it thanks to Jesus. I'm going to embody that and assume you're probably imperfect like I once was. And so I'm going to show grace and call out the gold. And I believe that's what Jesus is going after. It's about this, the, the, the atmosphere, the culture that we're cultivating in and around us. Are we cultivating a culture of toxic judgment of one another? Because if we do, it's like, how do we share the gospel? When, when the, the response is, you know, kind of F you to half the country, it's like, where's the gospel get in there? If my response when I see someone who thinks differently is, you are the spawn of Satan... And I'm going to let you know that I think that, yet salvation happens through relationship. We, we, we've just cut ourselves off from the number one avenue that God has to save the world right now, which is you in relationship with sinners. Because F.U. is not going to be a good start to the conversation. It's like that. It's what Jesus is getting at, Right? Now, I'm sorry I use that language, but it's like, is that not in a sense like almost acceptable now as a norm within our culture? And the, Jesus has a better way. I think that's what's very exciting is Jesus is going to come along and say, I have a better way that's not going to cost you the truth. You don't have to compromise. You don't make agreements with Satan. You do not agree with policies that, that put forth the, the doctrines of the enemy. But it's about the people. My heart is for the, the people who are lost, hurting, and broken, sheep without a shepherd. And how are you 
embodying my heart at the individual level and then as it spreads out in your sphere of influence. Because toxic criticism never won anybody into the kingdom of God. And that's where Jesus gets real personal in a sense. He says this, this passage is about personal responsibility. When we see things that are offensive, when we see people that bother, annoy, offend us, it's so interesting, Jesus' response is, well, get yourself in order before you become everyone else's critic. And I think and then he kind of like winks, you know, because <laughs> it's going to be a while. So slow down. You're 16. <laughs> but everyone's a critic, right? Nowadays, I mean, you know, you got those flags, but my goodness, social media, it has become the norm where the trolls come out, <laughs> right? And unfortunately, that's what rules the day in social media. It's the loud voices of toxic criticism, even while people don't know the facts. It's a judgment before all the information is out, before the facts are known, before the context is there, before any attempt at compassion for the person that you're criticizing. I mean, I remember one, rec remember one recently where there was a new library being built in our, in our city, and you would think, hey, kids reading books and stuff, reading, you know, might be good, but, and there was an article posted of all the information about it, and, and all these comments are, are good men if these citizens are just hammering the leadership of the city for wasting more money. Oh, we need to do this with the money. We need to do this. You're wasting more money. And it was really sad to me as a demonstration of this culture of toxic criticism because what was evident, they had not read the article because if they had read the article, it would have answered many of their questions, which was all of the funding, the many millions of dollars for a brand new, first class, fully furnished library came as a gift from the county of Riverside and we didn't pay a dime for it and got a multi-million dollar facility for free. That's pretty good for the kids. But people had no problem just bringing out the harshest criticism of the leadership of the city. But I put myself in that shoes in, I can be pretty quick to judge. I can be pretty quick to throw out my criticism before I know the facts, before I've walked in their shoes, before I've put on that lens of compassion and wondered maybe they're just going through some stuff in their life it's unbelievably hard. And maybe they were a little rude to me today, that the checkout clerk, or maybe someone cut me off, or maybe whatever, and maybe they've got someone dying of cancer in their family, and if I knew that, maybe I would have had a little more patience for they were a little short with me. And that's what Jesus is, is, is going after. And that's why... I believe, he starts with, instead of just doing the normal human thing where it's easy and quick to make critical judgments, which, remember, it's a final conclusion. Oh, this must be, they must be money laundering in Menifee. It's like, oh my gosh. It was free. <laughs> Wrong. So, according to Jesus, when there is a problem in that realm, a conflict, something we're frustrated by, or we're feeling a judgment coming, we're feeling a toxic criticism. It's amazing where Jesus is just like, here's how I want you to be different. Your primary responsibility is just to examine you. God wants us to look inward first, and then ask God, <laughs> Woo, it's courageous to be a Christian. God wants us to look inward first and for our first question to be, God, how do you want to change me? This is in the context of a problem with someone. You're hurt, you're offended, you're frustrated, and you feel that judgment coming, and I'm looking at this little kid being like, oh my God, what an idiot. And God's like, hello. 
You're preaching on this tomorrow. <laughs> God, what do you want to do in me? So Jesus draws a contrast. Either we can spend most of our time and energy trying to point out problems in other people, which is not a spiritual gift, by the way. It is the easiest thing in the world to do that is not the same as discernment of spirits, so let's be careful because I've heard that one, and I'm like, bro, the trolls on the internet point out people's problems just like you. That's not discernment of spirits. That's just called judgment. That wasn't for anybody in this room. That was because that got really quiet in here. <laughs> Woo! So Jesus is saying either we can spend our time and energy trying to point out problems in other people or we can spend that same time and energy honestly examining our own life and putting that effort toward our character growth. That's the call of Jesus. That's the adventure of being a follower of Jesus. Makes so much practical sense and wisdom though. I mean, if you think about these, this either or, where are we gonna spend our time, effort, and energy? Just criticizing each other for our own problems or working on our own character? If everyone does the judgment thing, then what do you have? You have, you know, hurting, broken, immature people complaining and blaming each other for all the problems in the world. It's kind of like the world we have right now. Instead of Jesus' upside-down way of the kingdom, and he says, oh, you want to make the world a better place? You see all these problems? Just look in the mirror, and you got a lot of work to do. And it will make the world a better place. So Jesus is saying if everyone spends the majority of their time and energy taking that personal responsibility for and working on our own imperfections and flaws, then our relationships are going to be much better. And so in a sense, it's like Jesus has your best interest in mind. You're frustrated, you're hurt, people, you're complaining. You want your relationships to be better? Yeah. Jesus is like, I know the real answer. It's you. I'm so glad this was Jesus' idea, not mine, because it's, <laughs> it's like, it gets real quiet. <sighs> so a distinctive of the follower of Jesus is that we would choose to stop the vicious cycle of toxic criticism and just say, you know what? Instead, I'm going to spend the vast majority of my time and energy working on my own growth with me and Jesus. And the good news is if everybody does that, if everybody would listen to Jesus, so now you can just say, well, hey, well, who's everybody? Well, you know what? The most important things in your life are not out there on the internet, and they're really not out there in the pol politics. They're first and foremost with you, and then those closest to you. So it's your spouse, it's your kids, it's your family, your friends, it's your community, it's your work. You know, you start moving out, but it's like, okay, you know what, that, that's really hopeful because if I can agree to this and model this and I can talk with my wife about it and I can model it for our kids and we can talk with some close friends about it and we can talk with our church family about it and we can have an influence in our community and it's like, oh, now, whoa, now you can start see, to see the wisdom of Jesus that if everyone would spend the majority of our time and energy working on our own development and not spending all that time Worrying about someone else's development or God's got, like, hey, I got them. They're my child. I'm working on them. What that also does is, is it removes so much negativity and toxic criticism from the relationships. Absolutely, then, prepares us to make not a negative contribution of, of toxic criticism, but the positive contribution of, man, I've been working on my own stuff, and I'm a little bit more like Jesus now, so I can bring this positive contribution to the relationship and make it better. Amen. So Jesus calls for that kind of 180-degree turn and flip for our intentional spending of time and energy in what ultimately becomes the, the kind of 
culture and atmosphere of relationships that we have around us. So just to kind of summarize this part, a key question to be asking ourselves when we notice what feels like that that quick criticism, that quick judgment, am I quickly blaming and criticizing them or am I investing my energy in how I might be able to change something to be part of the solution? And that's like constant Jesus fashion is that we get to become the solution to many of the problems in our own lives by Christ transforming our character. Or the solution to many of the challenges we face is Christ transforming our character into Christ-like character. You can really see this at so many different levels. I mean, just apply it into, into marriage, into parenting, into work, into church. We talked about politics. Jesus is so wise in the way that heaven can shift the whole atmosphere when we take the humble, poor in spirit route and say, God, would you, would you work on me? Now, with all that said, there is a place of speaking truth into other people's lives. Jesus, in fact, already addressed that at the beginning, almost the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. We looked at a passage in Matthew chapter 5 that he, he teaches a boldness in relationship, that if you're hurt, offended, feel bitterness rising up, that he even says, stop what you're doing in church, stop your worship, and go pursue reconciliation with that person. It's wow. So there is a healthy place within the body of Christ to pursue reconciliation, to be honest in our relationships. These messages are not at odds. <laughs> this is about the instinct of critically blaming others with, with, a, with a harsh and toxic criticism that becomes your atmosphere versus a humility, a courage that says, God, when, when there's challenges around me, my first MO is to examine my heart and say, how can I grow and be a part of the solution? And not stick it out there of, I'm assuming I'm doing it all right, and I'm going to blame them as the problem. But Jesus then goes on to say, so first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So plank versus speck, Jesus is talking about kind of the proportion of time and energy. So when you've done a lot of good work on yourself, is there a place where there's a speck in your brother's eye that you can share? Yes. Speak the truth in love, as Ephesians 4 says. There is an absolute special place in the context of trusted relationships between brothers and sisters in Christ where you can speak the truth in love about something in their life that is out of alignment with God's heart. And it actually helps them to grow. And, and seriously, like... When you build that trust and have those relationships, that's one of the greatest things you can ask for in life is that to have that person where you can say, hey, when I'm off base, will you please tell me? When I'm out of alignment, will you please tell me? I give you that authority and permission in my life to be that person who speaks truth because sometimes I don't see it well. And, and that is a beautiful, powerful place. I, I, I seriously, genuinely, that is one of the most unbelievably fruitful and valuable things with my wife and our relationship is as the trust is built and I know she loves me and I know she thinks I'm like special and great and cool and all these great things. Now I trust her. She can speak truth. And woo, she's good at that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> she got a little laser beam, you know. <laughs> okay, okay. Truth bomb, I got it. But I'm 100% seriously, truly grateful for the transformation and, I, and growth that I've seen in my life through a trusted relationship that then speaks truth in love. Like I look back now and I'm like, I, 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 I would never want life without that because I got my own blinders on. 
Or even when I say, God, show me the speck in my own eye. You know, I just sometimes, sometimes he's like, there's a log. I'm like, no, it's a little, show me the little speck. He's like, there's a log. It's so big, I can't even see it. And that's all of us at times. And so there is, I just encourage you, if you're not there, press into those trusted relationships. And it's so beautiful to be able to say, hey, please give me your honest feedback. Please give me that truth in love when I need it. And when you can develop those kind of relationships, you will see growth that you didn't know was possible. Christ-like transformation. With that, we'll close with just a, a couple quick things. Even when there is truth to be shared about another person's issues, it's helpful in small doses. I was listening to a, a podcast recently on a marriage and family therapist, and they, they put out a, a number that I've been wrestling with, I've been thinking about. I'm going to throw it out for you to test it and see if it resonates. And they said, in regards to relationships, and they're talking about truthful, honest relationships, close community, so the kind we're talking about right now, the kind that you would want to speak truth and love. And the number thrown out was that ideally you should have a seven-to-one ratio in the positive, encouraging interactions, tones, facial expressions, conversations, words spoken to constructive criticism. If you want that relationship to be life-giving, seven-to-one. And what this clinical psychologist shared was that divorce has become easily predictable. If a relationship has, has less than five to one ratio, they're headed for divorce. And this is just a clinical psychologist. I don't think even a, claims to be a Christian saying what happens, the stats are, if the ratio of positive encouragement to constructive criticism is five to one or less, think about that, five to one or less, those marriages end up in divorce. And this is a very good clinical researcher, so I, I trust those numbers. What was fascinating is that he also said if that number is 10 to 1 or above, they're also headed for divorce. Meaning if there's just so much just positive encouragement and never that helpful truth in love, because here's the bottom line, you're not married to Jesus. They need help sometimes. We need help sometimes. Okay, my wife's not married to Jesus. I need help sometimes. If she's just, you know, oh, you're awesome, you're awesome, you're awesome, you're nothing but awesome, that's not helpful. That's not going to help me grow to honor her in being that Christ-like, sacrificial, willing to lay down my life for her husband. I need to know some of the specifics sometimes. Like when you did this, that didn't work for me. That wasn't that sacrificial Christ-like love. Oh, okay, you're right. If I never get that, I'm not growing. And so there's this very interesting kind of sweet spot. That's why I say seven to one. It's kind of like that six to nine to one is that sweet spot of being positively encouraging, calling out the gold, you might say. This is gratitude. This is kind facial expressions. This is kind acts of service. This is how we appreciate them, what we like about them, how they're wonderful, how they're good, how they're a blessing. Oh, here's their gifts and passions. I love you. I appreciate you. Seven to one. With, oh, you didn't do the dishes again, huh? <laughs> there you go. Seven to one. And again, those numbers may be a bit arbitrary, but to me, that, that, that resonates with, with the reality of human nature. We can very easily get beat down, right? Too much, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, and it's no longer life-giving, it's just deflating and crushing. And so that's why I believe, back to Jesus, the emphasis is on do the primary work on you. And I believe the Holy Spirit is really nice. He's, he's, he's in that kind of sweet spot of seven to one <laughs> for us. He wants to encourage us, so that's where you don't need to be scared. When you say, hey, there's a challenge going on here and you want to do that plank 
Is there a plank in my eye? How can I grow? If you're actually listening to the Holy Spirit in a healthy way, there will be encouragement in the midst of. He is, he is the source of life. He brings abundant life. He is the encourager, the comforter. So he's really good if you're actually listening to him. He's really good at making sure that that ratio is a life-giving one for you. And that's what gives us the courage to then say, okay, I want to learn and grow. I want to be more Christ-like. Lastly here, and we'll close, there's a very weird phrase from Jesus at the end of this teaching where he says, don't give the dogs what is sacred. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So the context that he's talking about is these relationships with one another where we're not to judge, we're to work on ourselves. It's a hard verse to interpret. I believe it fits the context in this sense. If you have an insight into someone's life, an ability to speak the truth in love, and even if you are coming from humility and love, you need to be careful, we need to be careful about whether or not they are willing and ready to receive it. That's the pearl before the swine. I think that Jesus is talking about. That's giving dogs what is sacred. And I know that's rough language, but it it fits the context of what he's talking about. They'll trample it under their feet. They might turn and tear you to pieces. Meaning like, have you ever had a a piece of truth that you've shared? You thought it was in love. You thought it was in humility. And the person wasn't ready to receive it. And it can just turn and backfire and cause a massive blow up. Trample under your feet, turn and tear you to pieces. So I would submit to that to you as something to consider, something to pray on that the Holy Spirit, even in the midst of all this kind of practical stuff, that there's still a, a wisdom of discerning, when is that time to speak the truth in love? Is that person ready to receive it so that it's life-giving? All right. To wrap it up here. Judgment day is not today. That's, I think, just a beautiful declaration. Simple a meme, a prayer declaration for our mind when we feel that propensity to judge, to quickly criticize, to catch ourselves with a little phrase, a little prayer, a reminder of, oh, oh yeah, my identity in Christ, judgment day is not today, and I'm not the judge. I get to be the ambassador of reconciliation. I get to create a culture of grace where I call out the gold in people. And I certainly don't want to be a part of the devil's work of creating a culture of toxic criticism. So, wow, God gives me permission. I don't have to be a part of that. Judgment day is not today, and I'm not the judge. Dance like David